how did you, did, did you, you did not grow up uh, Mormon, correct? Correct. I was brought up in various Protestant churches. My father was Air Force. So we bounced around the U.S., went to different Christian churches. Okay. Well, so how did this happen? How did you uh, sort of gravitate towards evangelism towards the LDS? I had a Latter-day Saint girlfriend in high school for two and a half years off and on. Uh, the long story short is in the midst of that, I read the New Testament. I had one foot in uh, Mormonism, one foot out. I wasn't completely dedicated to it, but I was highly considering joining. And I was at the time reading the New Testament, I discovered Romans. And so grace conquered me. God showed me the gospel and I was born again. When I went to college, I went to Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew. And my Christian girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she went on a summer mission, missions trip, and that was a great thing to do. That's what all, the, all my peers were doing, and I thought, I would love to spend my summer doing a mission trip. And I thought, wow, I could, you know, I, I know a lot about the Latter-day Saint faith. I know the gospel. Why don't I just go to Utah? So I spent, I think, seven weeks out here, and I got addicted to doing evangelism. I just fell in love with sharing the gospel, especially uh, stranger evangelism. When I came back, I told my girlfriend, uh, Stacy, who's now my wife, uh, if we get married, we'll probably move to Utah. <laughs> now, where, where, <laughs> were you, where, was you, where were you at undergrad? Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. So, so the idea of moving to Utah was not even on her radar screen, right? <laughs> I introduced it pretty quickly. <laughs> and, so, and so she said, okay? She did, and she was a good sport about it. I, I, it was a tough move. When we, when we first moved here, she was pregnant, and we had no family and no friends here. And we lived in a little basement apartment in Orem, Utah. Uh, I'm very evangelistic. I'm very overt. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of a tough place to be dropped into. Uh, but fortunately, over time, God gave us really good friends, and everything has been great. Yeah, and how long, now, how long ago was that? When did y'all move here? December of 2005. Okay. And so, and so now you're in the tech industry. So have you been, were you always doing that as, uh, you know, as your tent making for, since you've been out here? From day one, when I arrived, with very few exceptions, I've been full-time doing computer programming. It's, but all right. And so you, 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 you're just a, you know, an evangelist by heart. So tell, you know, so tell, you know, those are listening, like, what are some of the things, I mean, I've gotten a chance um, to, I got to go down, I think once with you down to Temple Square. Um, and I know you do that uh, regularly, but what are some of the things that you do yeah, on a regular basis or, or even maybe you describe, you know, the work that y'all do down at Temple Square? Yeah. Since about 2007, we started going downtown to Temple Square, typically at the North Gate on Thursday nights, that's been because they have a choir practice and the tourists will cross the street. And it's just been a real fertile ground and time for conversational evangelism. And as that persisted over time, a group of friendships formed from a half dozen different churches in doing evangelism together. That's become its own kind of fellowship in the sense of, you know, a parachurch friendship group. We've talked to, it's hard to count, so many people from different faiths, a lot of them are Latter-day Saints that are locals. We've been consistently doing that besides winter and pandemics. <laughs> so, and rain and, and occasional laziness, but we've been pretty consistent about that. We've, we've just gotten to know the ropes. And so when it, at least when it comes to conversational or we call it stranger evangelism, we've matured into a pretty uh, well-functioning group. So I do that. I also work with Mormonism Research Ministry as an associate, uh, a researcher, an evangelist, a speaker, and I've been helping them with their web projects for quite some time. And I've been working on a YouTube channel since 2006, and I got into the YouTube scene pretty early just by the virtue of the fact that I had videos up and I kept uploading things. <laughs> it, just, it just blew up in a good way. Uh, I would post testimonies of ex-Mormon Christians and lectures from people who do ministry to Mormons, and it was a niche that needed to be filled. It's, uh, it's been of service to Christians. And so for those that are listening and would love to, you know, see more of your videos and stuff, what's, the, what's that YouTube channel? YouTube.com forward slash Jesus, not Joseph. Jesus, not Joseph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's good. All right. So we, what we wanted to talk about, you know, to, on today and then hopefully over the next, have you back over the uh, next couple of weeks is the debate that you had recently with a, a Latter-day Saint. Would you just maybe just, you know, two or three minutes for those of uh, our listeners that are engaging with LDS, I mean, you have been doing this for so long and you're just, you know, you just have developed, you know, you're just very skilled at it and very, very knowledgeable. What are some you know, two or three or, you know, or 10 <laughs> tips that you would give on um, maybe thing, you know, ways to start conversation, things not to say uh, in these conversations, maybe some topics to hit on, topics to avoid. I mean, what are just some of the, the major things that you've picked up over your years of doing this? So my go-to questions are pretty simple. I'll ask somebody here in Utah, at least, uh, where they're from. And if they're a Latter-day Saint, I'll, I love to ask, uh, where did you serve your mission? And that's a point of pride and of connection. And it's a great storytelling thing to hit on. You can ask, hey, what are some highlights from your mission? What are some conversations you remember? And I like to ask, did you ever get to talk to any born again Christians on your mission? What did you talk about? What are some of the topics that came up? And in the same vein, I like to ask people where they grew up and ask if they ever have had any evangelical or born again Christian friends where they grew up. And that, that question is really helpful in Utah because it re-provokes my heart to, to be reminded that a lot of the Latter-day Saints here in Utah have never really had a relationship with a born-again Christian. So uh, I like to ask if, if they've ever heard of uh, the gospel as explained by a born-again Christian, or if a topic comes up, I like to ask, have you ever heard of, uh, an evangelical explain that topic before? And it's almost always no. And so I, I think it's hard for people. I, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to have visiting teams here in Utah to train them with that question because they go out and they ask, you know, have you ever had any born again Christian friends? Have you ever heard the gospel explained by an evangelical before? And it's just no, no, it's pretty, you know, it's a dominant answer. So it helps you understand that you're not dealing with somebody who's heard the gospel over and over again. Uh, and you're not necessarily in need of having a, an adversarial debate, it's, it's a lot of times it's just explaining and showing and simplifying uh, what we Christians believe. A lot of Mormons don't even understand that we believe in the physical resurrection of the body or that the, this, this, that the Trinity is three persons in one being or that we believe that forgiveness brings a change of heart that produces uh, a new transformed life or that we think we will have relationships and the resurrection with people that we knew here at all. So a lot of Latter-day Saints are taught stereotypes from their culture about what born again Christians believe. And as much as scary it is, as scary as it is for people to talk to say a Mormon missionary, because they get the sense, oh, wow, they know their scriptures so well. Well, they know, you know, a couple dozen proof texts that they're trained to use. But if you just read one of the four gospels and ask, you know, about Jesus stories in one of the four gospels, you'll quickly find, oh, maybe the Latter-day Saints really don't know the word very well. And you can just introduce uh, Jesus stories. So one other topic, one other uh, tip I give for people is to pick one of the four gospels and to chew on it like a dog with a bone and to find a good audio Bible and listen to that gospel, you know, 20 or 30 times. Uh, or go to the Lumo Project and watch it 20 or 30 times. And to take stories thematically with a common thread and use them in evangelism uh, with Latter-day Saints or with whoever. And that's great because you can you can do it in narrative fashion and ask questions and and kind of wrap it up with a point. What what uh, uh, what gospel is there one that you particular that you that you have gravitated towards? The Gospel of Matthew chapters eight and nine have a jam-packed condensed list of stories of Jesus demonstrating his authority largely by verbal authority. So healing and commanding nature and forgiving and casting demons out. It's, you know, the, the centurion shows up and says, my servant is sick to the point of death. And Jesus says, I'll come. And the centurion says, nah, I, you know, I'm not worthy to have you come inside my house. And Jesus ends up remotely healing this man's servant by the word of his mouth. And a lot of this seems pretty simple to Christians, but to Latter-day Saints, authority is chiefly a kind of ritualistic, ordained priesthood function that ha comes through the channels of the, uh, the hierarchy of, of their church. And so to, to really make a great case 
that Jesus accomplishes his power through his words. Uh, and he makes promises through his words and on the basis of what he accomplished on the cross offers the gospel through words and through belief in his words is pretty revolutionary and it undercuts the heart of Mormonism. So I love sharing seven or eight Jesus stories with a Latter-day Saint and then just kind of wrapping it up with a topic because it sort of primes them for the answer without me even having to make my points explicitly up front. Yeah, I remember when you were um, sharing with our, well, our group that came out here a couple weeks ago to Utah, and you were sharing that the idea of just you know asking them if at, in the conversations, asking if they've ever heard the gospel, and then challenging to share the Jesus stories. And and when our students started doing that, it was very it was almost, it's heartbreaking really because you have these you know professing professing Christians, you know the LDS who are saying all these Christianized things, and yet they've never heard the gospel. And, and so it really did change the tone, I think, of the way in which our students were talking to people, because it does, it's, it, it, you, it becomes much less, you're looking for a fight and you're just, mm -hmm. you know, you just, it just breaks your heart and you're just thinking, no, it's, this is, I it, just want to share the good news with someone who's just as lost as, you know, as anybody and yet has religiosity, uh, you know, to the utmost. I want to encourage people to move to Utah and plant churches, even if you have zero interest in Mormonism or apologetics that's that's uh, particularized to Mormonism. If you just came and had a heart for church planning, for simply sharing the gospel, for being a Christian presence, and for general apologetics regarding the nature of God, the reliability of the Bible, the resurrection of Jesus, you could keep yourself busy till you die here. Because a lot of the people I talk to here are, even if they're Latter Day Saint in, in veneer. I, I find out that they're kind of like agnostics and embryo. So I love, I love asking Latter-day Saints, what religion would you be if you weren't a Mormon, if you weren't a Latter-day Saint? And, you know, you, you'll get funny answers like, well, I'd be a Buddhist. And so you could follow up and say, well, do you think there's any good reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus that are independent of Mormonism? That is a great way to circumvent all of Mormonism and just go straight to really core reasons why we trust the resurrection of Jesus and the Bible and the existence of God. And similar questions are like, well, if you weren't a Mormon, do you th think you would still believe in God? A lot of Latter-day Saints will say no, or, or they'll say yes, and you'll say why, and, 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 and they're like, well, I don't really know. Yeah, the Mormon apologetics stuff to me is really important. I mean, if I'm going to spend a decade and a half, I have to shore up on that and be willing, be ready to give an answer and to engage them where they're at. But... I, I think the thing that I've been most surprised by here in being here in Utah is that general apologetics ends up being more important than Mormon apologetics. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think you, one of our first conversations, you, you told me that in, um, yeah, it just, because you, you, it's easy to get overwhelmed and you think, look, I'm not, I don't know, you know, I don't, I think about like you or Bill McKeever or Sandra Tanner. I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, 1% of what y'all know about Mormonism. And so you think, wow, that's just such a steep learning curve. And it is, but just taught but even just coming out and just sharing the gospel and just some general arguments for God's existence and resurrection and reliability of the New Testament. Because I think one of the things that you talk about a lot is, and this is why that is, is just, we see the, the people that are walking away from the faith and uh, the LDS faith are, are, you know, for the most part going towards atheism. And so, you know, we're, your job is twofold here is not, you know, you're not just trying to uh, disabuse them of their belief system, but you're also trying to, sh to show them why there's, there's good reasons to believe that Christianity is true. And that's, and, and so even if that's all you're doing, then you're, you know, like you always say, say you're just kind of planting seeds for the fact that you're pretty sure at some point they're going to, they're going to have some agnosticism. And so you're planting seeds to believe that there, there's evidence for the resurrection, that God exists, that the New Testament's reliable, you know, even if right now they're professing that they believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's, I mean, you know, I just, yeah, I second, uh, obviously being out here for a whole uh, six months. So obviously an expert on being out here, but, <laughs> but uh, be, you know, just being out here is just different. And then getting people to come out here and, you know, our group that was out here for, for the week, just, it was, it was incredible to see them be out here and then to, to meet the, the LDS people and, you know, really just to fall, have, you know, fall in love with them in the sense of just, 
just really care for them and want them to see the gospel and hear the gospel. And, and then, so anyway, it's just a, it's an interesting place uh, to say the least to, to do ministry. And so, uh, you know, it certainly encourage lots of people to come out and hopefully we're going to do lots more of those trips uh, in the future. And so when we were doing the trip, um, we actually um, were able to, uh, you had already, you've, I know that you and uh, Kwaku L, who is a, a Latter-day Saint, have debated before, and you had already scheduled a debate, and um, you know, certainly by God's grace, we were able to, to do it on, on the last day of our trip, and I think it was a cool way for our students that were out here to, to end the trip. And so I thought we, what we could do today is just let you, you know, just kind of debrief a little bit uh, about the debate. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, it was broken up into three sections. So probably just get to the first section uh, on this episode. And then hopefully in the future, we can look at um, the second uh, uh, and third topic. But what, so your background with Kwaku, you, you guys have debated before, or maybe, uh, maybe share a little bit about uh, y'all's relationship. So I saw him on YouTube and the first thing I thought was this guy, this young guy is being used by the Mormon church. And the more he starts to read in his defense of Mormonism, uh, the more likely it is that he's going to get burnt out by Mormonism. Why do you think he, why do you think that, that he was being used by the, what do you mean by that? Used by the LDS? Um, well, he's really good at the, you know, he's kind of got a theater background. He presents really well. <clears throat> he he's not from Utah. He doesn't have the same hypersensitivities as a lot of Utah Mormons have about interacting with people from a different faith. He's got a more you know boisterous, bold, willing nature to talk, and he just doesn't he doesn't feel like he's from Utah. The other thing is he's he's an African American Latter Day Saint, and that's pretty rare. I think the LDS Church is probably pretty excited to put him up front to have him represent. But, you know, when I first met him, I thought, I just thought, oh, man, this is just a, like, you know, as a young man. So what I did is I messaged him, and we ended up meeting at a coffee shop, ironically. He didn't drink coffee, but I think we talked for about three and a half hours, and I gave him a Tim Keller book. I think it was either Reason for God or Making Sense of God. You know, that's so interesting, because I was just listening to his, when he was on Apologia Radio with uh, White, James White and Jeff Durbin, and they were asking him what book you have on the Trinity. And he actually mentioned that book, which is, that's just kind of comes full circle that, uh, that you were the one that gave it to him. Cause he, they were asking him what book on his shelf uh, mentioned the Trinity, you know, dealt with the Trinity from a Christian perspective. And he mentioned that book. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I, and it really wasn't, I wasn't trying to have a public relationship with him. I was trying to have a private sort of seed planting relationship because I have so many other Mormon acquaintances and friends that you, know, you meet them. And then 10 years later, they're gone. And so I wanted to plant those seeds really early. So the nature of our conversation really wasn't focused about Mormonism. It was at the reliability of the New Testament, the documents, the resurrection, the moral argument for God. That was the main sort of thrust of the conversation. And so some time went on and I forget how this sort of evolved, but we ended up doing a, uh, a street dialogue. We recorded it, sort of more time went on and we ended up so he ended up doing more and more YouTube stuff, and it became more more clear to me that he's he's going to be more combative against Christianity, even more combative, pretty critical of Christians. He was really starting to dig his heels in, and he really started to get more aggressive toward Christians. And he wrote a piece about how God, uh, the God of Calvinism, is conceited. And there was some parts in there where, you know, the God of Calvinism is doing everything for his own glory. And he, he's, you know, it's petty. Now, the idea that God does everything for his own glory is pretty broad to all of Christianity. We'll get to that because I, I know that comes up big in the debate. So I definitely, we'll definitely touch yeah, on that. Yeah, no, no rabbit trail there, but that, that, but that was the reason why I, I proposed that we have a debate about, and the debate was called, does God have glory that, that he will not share? Does God have glory that he will not share? And so we talked about whether God knows all things, uh, whether, you know, we're going to be worshipped, whether God alone will be worshipped. And, you know, he, he wanted to talk about some Calvinism stuff there too. But so we ended up doing another street dialogue after that, which should be online here soon. And then we ended up doing another debate here recently, like you just mentioned. And the occasion for that debate was he did a video on YouTube where he was mocking Christians who, when they leave Mormonism and become evangelicals, 
there's this beautiful phrase that we love in Utah. It's like the Utah Christian bumper sticker slogan. It's, it's Jesus is enough. And it's a beautiful motto slogan. It encapsulates a lot, especially for ex-Mormon Christians who have the sense that, you know, I don't need the temple anymore. I don't need to prove myself worthy anymore. I don't need to be worried about relationships in the resurrection anymore. I don't, I don't need to yeah, there's so much to it. Jesus is so satisfying. He's so adequate. He's more than enough. And so Kwaku was really going after that motto. And he was implying that for people who really believe what we say about grace, it just gives us a license to sin more. And he was also coming down to Manti, trying to do some sort of YouTube stunt kind of interviews with Christians that were doing evangelism to, uh, to Mormons. You know, he just started to get more combative and more, uh, Wait, more, for, those uh, that, for those that don't know, what is, what oh, is Manti? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so in Manti, Utah, there is a temple. Uh, up until this past year, for decades, they had a yearly pageant. And the pageant goes for about a week and a half. And it's a beautiful situation where you have these closed off streets. Thousands of Mormons come. I mean, like, like a lot <laughs> of Mormons come. And they, they set down their, their blankets and they have a couple hours to kill. They loiter for quite some time and they go to the booths. They get root beer and, and um, you know, food. And, and what happens is a lot of the teenagers and young adults and people of all stripes they come out and uh, they, they talk to the Christians who do stranger evangelism. And so you have this beautiful sea of like a hundred Christians plus of uh, youth groups and young adult groups and others that have come to learn to share their God, learn, learn to share the gospel with Mormons. And so you have these beautiful, you know, just like clusters of teenagers and young adults and, and, you know, older people having these, you know, small group conversations and it's very gentle. It's very conversational. There's a few of us that street preach like me. Kwaku kind of came down there with the kind of an axe to grind against the Christians, seemingly to me, and he just didn't didn't treat them very well at all. And so for me, Kwaku started. He he stopped becoming a, you know, that as I knew him in the very beginning, and he was more of a an overt opponent of the gospel and the, and the Christians sharing to him. And he he's got more and more of an influence on. YouTube. So in this last debate, I engaged him with a more concerted sense of engaging a false teacher to the encouragement of Christians. So yeah, for anybody who's interested in looking at any of his stuff, Kwaku, L E L, uh, you can Google, you know, you put him on YouTube, you Google him or whatever on YouTube and you'll find a lot of his videos. But so the topic of the debate was, is Jesus enough? As you said, Aaron, kind of going off that video that he had uh, made before and and so really three topics, uh, is salvation by faith alone, our families forever, and was there a great apostasy? And so we'll, we'll talk about just the first of those uh, today, uh, is salvation by faith alone? Uh, and so I don't, maybe do you want to, do you want to, do you, I guess, do you have any kind of broad uh, takeaways from the debate or anything kind of on the front end, you know, maybe that you would, that you've been, as you've been ruminating or thinking about it for a couple of weeks that, uh, you know, things that you wanted to share in regards yeah. to that or, you know, takeaways from. Um, I've done three debates. One was with a Mormon apologist named Robert Vukic on the, on a book called The Miracle of Forgiveness. It's a Mormon book. And I've done two with Kwaku. And this last debate, you know, you kind of have a different mindset going into each one. And I went into this one with the mindset of more energy and over refutation and I, I guess what I can say is I brought my full-throated evangelical preacher evangelist self, and I, I felt more like that than I felt like a debater, honestly, in, in some sense. And so there's some strategic trade-offs to that. And one is people show up to a debate and they're like, I didn't really expect someone to be like a fiery preacher <laughs> during his presentations. And I can totally, in ret everything's in retrospect at this point, but I can see, oh yeah, I can see how that that mode of speaking was unexpected. Also, to a Latter-day Saint audience, sort of a, a fiery, you know, sort of over energetic, enthusiastic, exuberant, bold pre style of preaching, that's kind of scary to a Latter-day Saints because they have a very hypersensitive, almost monotone cadence to, to their spiritual mode of speech. If you listen to their uh, apostles and prophets speak, they kind of associate I call it soporific because it's kind of sleep inducing, uh, but it, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, very just subdued manner of speech. And they, they kind of equate that to spirituality. Whereas from the evangelical world, if you preached like that, you probably 
would have a hard time holding a pastorate in some churches because you're expected to treat the word of God with a kind of uh, force at times, you know, when it's meant to be boldly proclaimed. Anyway, so that, that was kind of looking back, I'm like, huh, I wish, I wish I could have, I wish I would have slowed down. I had so much material I was packing into the presentations. And if I had slowed down, I think I could have more effectively communicated my heart to uh, the audience and uh, help, the, help the audience kind of zero in on some points because I, I was really working through my notes as fast as I could. The other thing too is in a debate, you, you, have, you may have to make a judgment call on, in the, in the cross-examination when to move on to the next question. And I, <clears throat> I was trying to get through so much material and I was, I think it was so aggressive with it that I, and again, I just, yeah, I was, I was really, you know, kind of high heartbeat. I was going at it pretty hard. So if I had to look, if I could go back in time, I'd say, hey, Aaron, take a deep breath, <laughs> and cal calm down. Uh, you can still make your bold proclamative points. But uh, all the other, and the, the last thing is going into the debate, uh, I thought, okay, we're going to talk about salvation by faith alone, the great apostasy and families forever or not. And I thought, okay, I just poured all my time into preparing for these topics, but I guess I just didn't really anticipate Kwaku refusing to really focus on those topics, at least for the first two. And so in the, uh, his presentations and in the cross-examination, it kind of just became an opportunity for him to go after other topics that he wanted to really talk about. And I had to make a, judgment, a snap judgment call of, do I, am it, do I kind of answer in bold, unapologetic, unembarrassed ways about hard questions, which has its strength because I don't want to act like I'm hedging or embarrassed about what I believe. But the trade-offs there are, that's just not the debate people were helping advertise for. Um, that's not the debate people that, you know, you help sponsor. It's not the debate I helped prepare for or that people, you know, it, it's kind of ends up being a false pretense. So, and, and the other thing too is, um, it makes it puts me in a position to talk about things I hadn't really prepared to talk about, where we really didn't ha have an opportunity to flesh out distinctions and terms, and uh, you know, kind of build an argument. And so I, I felt pretty cheated at the end that we had gone down rabbit trails, and I felt terrible about uh, sort of taking the bait on uh, topics that weren't our assigned topics. Right. Which yeah, uh, and and we'll get in you know we'll get into that um, here, but I think it, to your you know to to your credit it was you know you like you said you'd prepared i think two things one is i think it's that one of the reasons i wanted to kind of give the background because i think you have a background and with him and and you even said you know the way in which you approach this was was different than just an academic debate with somebody you you know was was sort of uh, brokered online and you didn't really have a relationship with them right I and mean, there's the backstory to it so i think the way in which you um can come across as a bit, you know, fire. There was, there was, there was a reason behind that. It wasn't just, it was, there was, it wasn't just, uh, there was thinking behind it. And there was, it was a, it was actually a tactical decision that people didn't understand the backstory. So I think that's helpful, especially hopefully people will watch the debate um, afterwards. And that's the other reason I wanted, I thought this would be good is, is to give, uh, you know, a chance to kind of flesh out some of the things that were brought up that really, you know, weren't, you know, they just weren't part of the, especially the, you know, stuff for, that we're talking about today just weren't, on the table as uh, what we were supposed to be debating, but it is interesting with him. I was because I was watching that uh, debate that he did with uh, James White uh, on Apology Radio, and is um, it is it, I, I do think he uh, correct me if I'm wrong. What, what your kind of perception is, but I, I think he equates Christianity with Calvinism, um, and I've heard him say something along the lines of, uh, "If you press Christianity, you're going to get you know to sort of his logical extreme, you get Calvinism." And so that's, you know, so part of his whole discussion with Christianity is, is that, uh, I don't know, was that your perception yeah, or do you, you think I'm... I recorded an hour and a half dialogue with him at Temple Square. One part of that that came out that, that I was listening to this past week, in it he says that if God creates anything with a full knowledge that sin will result from that creation. So even if his original pristine good blameless, sinless creation knowingly will result through, you know, moral agents or whatever you want to say it, that makes God the author of sin. So for him, any model where God has definite foreknowledge, basically any other view than open theism, ends up making God the cause of evil. 
And so for him, Calvinism is just like his, the way he construes it anyway. That's just where you go to, 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 to attack that. But people have to understand that it's not like he's an Arminian and he's contrasting his Arminianism or, or his Molinism with Calvinism. No, he's like an open theist who doesn't believe in creation ex nihilo, who in this dialogue said, you know, he's totally cool with, with our God being downstream from billions of other ancestral prior deities, uh, ancestor deities. He's totally cool with that. It, it's just for him, he doesn't even believe that God is the origin of good. He, he's not, he's not the creator of good or evil. He's not the author of good or evil. He just, he wants to help God escape from the theodicy or the problem of evil. And for him, Mormonism is the only way you can do that by getting rid of God's foreknowledge, getting rid of God's uh, creative capacities. Uh, but yeah, I think the other thing too is that honestly, a lot of the uh, evangelists that are pretty active on the street come here in Utah from the more reformed point of view. So if you're listening to this and you're a Molinist and you're an Arminian, please come out and join us, by the way. <laughs> I mean, we, the, the fellowship we have is so beautiful and so broad across stodgy Presbyterians and charismatics and, you know, pretty principled philosophical Arminians and, you know, a bunch of old school Protestants. What's really cool about Utah is that when we do evangelism, we're talking about really simple things like whether or not there's only one God or whether there's billions of gods or whether salvation is by faith alone or whether it's by, you know, covenant keeping worthiness and earning exaltation. Um, so it, it creates this beautiful bond between believers who are glorying in these simple gospel truths that we share across all of evangelicalism. Yeah, and I think that was, that was one of the things that I noticed immediately when I was out here is how easy it is when I, you know, back, back home and, or, you know, back in the South, wh how easy it is for us to divide. I mean, we, you know, we divide over anything, you know, just because we'll start, you can start a church on the corner and but out here, they're just, I just noticed that there was this, you know, we, you disagree on a lot of these non-essentials uh, that, that very, that matter, you know, you're tremendously, and, and we could, you know, have these great discussions about it. But in the end, the, the, those essentials that unite all of us, you know, across these spectrums, um, there really is um, a unity uh, of the body out here that's just very different than than back in the South, uh, which I appreciated, you know, from the beginning, as soon as, as soon as we got out here. So I think that's, uh, I think you're, you know, you're dead on on that. Um, if you find out somebody's a monotheist, you shake their hand extra hard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or, or it's Corona season, so I guess you can give them an elbow rub. But that's um, right. Uh, yeah. Air five. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's let let me let's for you know for our our listeners the 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 question is salvation by faith alone. You know, by God's grace, we would have maybe some LDS listeners or or people even that are wrestling with these questions. You know, who knows who's listening this into the into the, in the future, what, you know, what, you know, what's your, what was, what's your, you know, sort of um, summary of what you shared in the, to the answer to that question is salvation um, by uh, grace through faith. Alone? So salvation at minimum, or even by standard definition in Mormonism simply means that everyone's going to be resurrected. Now to a Protestant, that's not good news by itself because John chapter five says that some are resurrected unto damnation. It's not a perk necessarily, unless you're resurrected unto life and a renewed heart and spirit and <clears throat> glorified body. So when you say is salvation by grace, a Mormon might say, absolutely, I agree with that. But they might mean two things by that. They might mean, well, everyone's going to be resurrected. And secondly, they might mean, well, you know, as you pick this out, it takes some time to kind of extract definitions. But it, in Mormon theology, there are three heavenly kingdoms, and they're called the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom. And the heavenly Father and Jesus Christ dwell in the top kingdom. Jesus visits the second, and then he doesn't even visit the third. And so when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions, in the King James anyway, modern translations would say many rooms, but they, they construe that verse to mean that there are kingdoms that Jesus doesn't even dwell in that you might end up in uh, someday, so they call them heavenly kingdoms. And so they'll say, well, salvation's by grace because it doesn't take much. <laughs> to, you can just basically not be a murderer and be a decent person and you're going to end up in the terrestrial kingdom. But Mormonism is essentially a form of universalism. They're not too concerned about people going to an eternal condemned hell, sort of. Uh, so they'll give their own people a sense of urgency that they need to earn exaltation, which is a key word for them. That means... Exaltation means going to the celestial kingdom, the top kingdom to be with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and being with your family and becoming a God over your own 
progeny someday. So for them, that's earned. That's not salvation. That, that's earned. Exaltation must be fully earned. And so when, when you're talking about salvation with Latter-day Saints, oh my goodness, every single term has been so radically redefined and so radically repositioned in a completely different worldview that it takes so much definitional groundwork just to communicate clearly. And so the two things I tried to do in the debate, one is I tried to give some definitional meat to the phrase salvation by faith alone. I tried to list out benefits that are particular to the salvation I speak of, eternal life, the gift of the Holy Ghost, as they would call it, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, being guaranteed of your inheritance. Ephesians 2, Paul's, we're all familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we have been saved, not by works, not of ourselves, the city man should boast, it's by faith. But the verses prior to that, Paul says that we have been raised with Jesus, seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. Now, where is Jesus seated according to Latter-day Saint theology? Well, it's in the celestial kingdom. So for a Christian to be told that they are already, as it were, seated with Christ, raised with Christ, positioned where he is. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, that's a perk they don't get. That's a perk that Christians have that they don't have. And also that he freely justifies and forgives us um, of our sins. So I tried to really flesh out the kind of salvation that I believe we have by faith alone. And by faith alone, I really tried to define that as empty handed faith. So it's not that it's not coupled with the necessary and inevitable fruits of a transformed life at some point, but the faith that approaches God doesn't present its own fruits. It doesn't present its own merit. It doesn't present its own prerequisites. Empty handed faith is the kind of faith that declares spiritual bankruptcy. It's, uh, it's like a beggar. Um, so I truly tried to paint that picture and then talk about how that is the only way we can have a relationship with Christ such that we would really love him from our hearts have our hearts melted. And I tried to give two Latter-day Saint specific analogies. In the Latter-day Saint faith, you have to abide by the uh, commandments adequately to receive upon inspection a temple recommend. So you have a, an interview with your bishop, if you're a Mormon, and they decide whether you're worthy of a temple recommend. And that recommend, this little piece of paper, or sorry, a card, it has a barcode on it. You present it when you go to one of their temples and they scan it and it determines whether or not you can enter to certain parts or participate in certain parts of the temple. That's not by faith alone. That's by worthiness, they would say. And so the analogy I gave is that Jesus has his own temple recommend. And this temple recommend is really special. You know, it gives us entrance into the very presence of God. And Jesus, as a gift to those who receive it by empty-handed faith, gives us his temple recommend. It's a beautiful analogy. For the Latter-day Saint, that's not something you get for free. That's something you have to earn after a lifetime. Uh, well, after, not a lifetime in this respect, but... Uh, but you have, to keep, you have to keep up the works in order to keep it. Right. You have to keep doing and doing and doing, yeah. The second analogy concerns the lifetime achievement. It's, I really was trying to drop a little bit of a bomb here. There is a temple ceremony that Mormons don't know about it. Um, so they have something of an anointing in what's called their endowment in their temple. People have to Google that. And that's a pretty, you know, well-known ordinance that Mormons go through in the temple. And they, you know, they seal, they're sealed to uh, family members and so forth. They have to be married. But the second anointing in Mormonism is a, an ordinance or a ceremony that ensures or assures one of eternal life. And to use historic language, it seals them up to eternal life. It's kind of like assurance of salvation that evangelicals would have. It's kind of like it's kind of like eternal security in an ordinance. And it's, it's only given to the apostles and prophets and I think some general authorities and mission presidents and some others. But you really have to be pretty high up there in the upper echelons of the church leadership. And after you've demonstrated decades of church faithfulness and loyalty, they give a select few the second anointing, which is essentially the assurance of eternal life. And I thought, that's a great analogy for what Christians have in Christ by faith. And so I used that and I encouraged everyone to Google it. And that's kind of a bomb to throw because that's not something they really want their own members to know about. Second, about the second anointing in general. They don't want them to know anything about that, right? In fact, one of the 
references, if you go to their church website, lds.org, it'll redirect to their new domain. And if you just search for the, the keywords second anointing, one of the first things you'll get as a result is a teacher's manual that says, if somebody asks about second anointing, don't answer about it. <laughs> it's, it, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's not for public consumption and they don't widely advertise it. So I wanted to widely advertise it and I wanted to talk about how what I have in Christ is even better than that. And it's a free gift I received by empty handed faith. So lastly, I talked about works and Latter -day, you know, Latter-day Saints are pretty anxious about this whole evangelical doctrine of salvation by faith alone, because it sounds to them like it sounds to people for the last 2000 years, it sounds like we're just giving people a license to sin and that it doesn't really help secure a changed life. It doesn't really help, you know, produce the fruits and the holiness that the New Testament really prior, you know, really up, uplifts is important. And so I talk about how works have a in, really incredible role to play in the Christian life. They necessarily and inevitably show the tested genuineness of my faith. They're, they're a proof of the authenticity of my faith. That's why we have James t chapter two. And, and they also fulfill the purpose I have in life. My purpose is to glorify God. And I ask Latter day Saints, you know, sometimes if you didn't have to earn exaltation, you know, what reasons would you have left to obey God? And a lot of Latter day Saints are like, I don't know. Like, well, I have, I have a lot of reasons to obey God that don't depend on me having to earn this. And so, yeah, that was sort of the presentation. And then I can talk about the cross examination. It was just really good because you were talking about, you know, it's the works or the evidence of, but not the merit or use the, I think you use also the term, the, the purpose, not the prerequisite. So you're, you're, you know, the, it's, you know, it's the idea of, you know, what, what equals faith, you know, is it just, you know, is it, is it just, or sorry, you know, salvation, is it just faith or does faith equal salvation and then works, you know, or is it faith mm. and works that equal salvation and, and, you know what? I just actually just read uh, during my quarantine time. I've been reading a lot. I just read, <laughs> read a uh, um, biography of Luther and just you know just how revolutionary this idea was as he's just you know as he's reading Romans and you know in Galatians and just coming to this understanding that it, it that it's not by anything that I do and that, so I just that whole idea that it's not you know it's 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 evidence of our faith but not merit. I thought that was you know that's you know it's important in these conversations but also you know in conversations with with Catholics uh, as well. So, so you, you know, you laid that out, um, I thought, uh, you know, very well. Uh, so Kwaku's response, and so, that, you know, kind of lay it out um, and then let you respond to it. Um, so his, so, and also, I think, you know, to your point earlier, you had, we, y'all had 10 minutes each. So you did all of that in 10 minutes, which was pretty masterful to, to get it out in 10 minutes. So yes, you can, uh, you know, you, you can't really be faulted for trying, you know, for, for, uh, Put, trying to cram, you know, you crammed a lot in 10 minutes. And so uh, to get all that out was pretty masterful. Um, and so, but so his basic argument, I mean, you know, correct me what, if I, basically his argument was twofold. Uh, one, faith, uh, you know, basically he's basically it was kind of like, well, what is faith? Uh, and then he kind of said that historically faith and works weren't really separated and it's only become recently that they're separated faith and works and you know they're kind of like two wheels on a bicycle and then he quoted James 2 and read the whole pretty much the whole chapter um well you know the, the second part of James 2 Key um, parts. Yeah. yeah and then and then that was that was the whole part one <laughs> so you know what just would you uh, we I actually did a whole episode I think on James 2 you know at one point but what's your just because this is obviously comes up in any conversation with LDS. What's your just, you know, your response to when they bring up James 2 as uh, saying that it's, you know, it's works uh, and not faith alone? So the evidence, not merit, purpose, not prerequisite grid helps me a lot. And Kwaku, all he really demonstrated from James 2 is the inseparability, the inevitable inseparability of faith and works. That's pretty classical Protestantism there. That's, that's not the debate. It's just not the debate. The debate is whether faith empty-handed is the alone instrument of receiving these salvific benefits. In other words, um, if you haven't worked up, you know, a bunch of fruits and works, are you able right now to receive forgiveness and justification and adoption and the gift of the Holy Go Spirit? They say Holy Ghost here in Utah, Holy Spirit. Um, so if you ever hear me say Holy Ghost, I'm just trying to use, it's just, it's just accommodating LDS language here, but um, yeah, Elizabethan King James language, but so that that aspect of evidential works is not controversial. The controversial aspect of it 
is the meritorious and the prerequisite aspect. Do I have to earn eternal life and do I have to do a series of works that result in eternal life? And a lot of Latter-day Saints really aren't thinking about the distinctions there. So they might veer the discussion toward the inseparability of faith and works and then the evidential value of works, which is what I think James 2 is really getting at. You know, James says, show, I will show you my faith by my works. And even when James goes on to say, uh, one is justified by works and not by faith alone. It's very clear that the, the sense in which that he's speaking of justification there is a vindicating kind of authenticating justification. Kind of like uh, Jesus says, wisdom is justified by her deeds. There's this different sense that, uh, that the, there's a semantic domain of the word justification. Paul might have used the word justification that way in Romans 2 once, but the way he uses it broadly, Paul, elsewhere, he is referring to something more legal, where uh, our sins are counted to Christ and Christ's righteousness is counted to us. And so he's, Paul elsewhere sets up a, more of an argument to that effect, whereas James 2 is really talking about the test of genuineness of faith, of living faith. So it, 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 it comports quite nicely with Protestant theology. The problem, though, is that in Kwaku's presentation, he's, he's spent about one, I, I actually am guesstimating here, so I, I, maybe I can wrong, but maybe one or two minutes. I don't know. You spent, and then he, you've spent infinitely longer. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he went through it about as fast as I did, except for, the, except for really reading all of, James, you know, reading that passage of James 2, and that was it. Yeah, it, it, what seems really um, frustrating, <clears throat> I have other words like unethical even about this, is um, the salvation by faith alone topic, it ha we could talk about that for days because it's got so much to it. And he, he knew very well that they had, that topic had its own domain of terms and ideas. And so what he did is he immediately, he basically transitioned to say something to the effect of salvation by faith alone is kind of a moot point if predestination is true. So let's talk about predestination. Aaron doesn't, he said, he said it's kind of moot because Aaron doesn't really believe in salvation by faith alone. And then he goes on to introduce, because Aaron's a Calvinist and, you know, therefore he believes in predestination. And so his position was um, that, there, you're, that you as a Calvinist, um, that you're not saved by your faith alone. You're saved by God's decree that God had determined before uh, even your existence. And then he quoted some Cal, you know, quoted Calvin. Um, but basically his whole, his point was um, your faith alone doesn't exist it's only God's decree alone that ultimately is what saves you. So he was trying to make the argument that you don't even believe in salvation by faith alone. You actually believe in salvation by God's decree. Yeah, it's a category error. And he's basically saying that his position in this debate is that we shouldn't be having this debate. <laughs> and uh, I gave a whole presentation about how I could affirm that proposition. And his job was to disaffirm the proposition. So it was a massive red herring. Yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about the cross-examination. So yeah, because I mean, we can get in, because that'll take us into, to some, but I mean, maybe just, but just speak to us for a second, because I think, because like you said, I mean, let's just, let's just say, let's just grant him as much as we can from the discussion. Even if you were to grant everything that he said in, in that statement, um, it would still be the means by which God has decreed salvation and it would be by faith alone or by faith plus work so even if even if you were to grant him the whole thing it still doesn't he still hasn't the the means by which god has um you know orchestrated to um to bring to to bring about his decree would either be by faith alone empty-handed as you stated or faith place plus faith plus works so it, even if what he's saying is true he still has to he's the question still is on the table of which one is it yeah, Protestants refer to faith as the instrument of salvation. It, it alone is the instrument. It's a means. So we could talk about a different domain. We could say God has ordained doctors. He has decreed that doctors use ventilators to treat coronavirus victims who are in you know, intensive care so that many of them may be healed. And you might say, well, then why even use ventilators? <laughs> it's right. Like, yeah. On, on his view, he would say, well, there's no, it's actually not the ventilator that's doing it. It's God that's doing it. And you would say, 
in one sense, ultimately you're right, but like you said, but you're confusing the, the, the instrumentation of, which, of the way in which God is doing that. But even then, you still haven't, you know, if, if, the, if the debate was, should we use ventilators or ventilators plus something else, you've, mas- you've masterfully not engaged with the material at all by just saying, well, ultimately it's God that's doing it. You still haven't even right. engaged with the subject. And the more you get to know Quakey's position, as, at least as how he's articulated elsewhere, his complaint against Calvinism really is not from the vantage point of Molinism or Arminianism. It's from the vantage point that any deity who creates creatures ex nihilo, out of nothing, knowing what would result, that downstream at some point that would result in moral agents committing sins, that makes God the author of evil, and that makes the sort of instrumentalities that follow a moot point. So it, what's interesting here is that open theism, which is the sort of non-committal position that Quaker takes, Maybe because uh, that's sort of where the whole thing went, at least in the um, in the in the uh, cross examination. So, we what is yeah? So, what is open theism? Because that's what I, I mean. I certainly wanted to touch on that because that's the position he's going to have. You know, that's the position he he holds to. What does that mean for those who've never heard that term? Open theism is the idea that God doesn't know the definite future, so he might know possibilities of what might come to pass, but he doesn't know the certain and definite future with especially respect to human decision-making. So God might have a game plan for a, like a decision tree about how things might work out uh, given each fork in the road, but he doesn't know which fork in the road people will take. So he doesn't have middle knowledge. He doesn't have simple foreknowledge. He doesn't have knowledge of what you know, libertarian free will creatures of any sort would ever uh, take. So open theism is the idea that essentially God doesn't know the certain future because he doesn't know what decisions moral agents will make. One really interesting point here is that Mormonism doesn't at the institutional or mainstream level take the position of open theism. It, it, at, the, at, the, at the lay level, at the cultural level, and at the institutional level with respect to its uh, manuals and its mainstream thought, Mormonism pretty simply holds to divine foreknowledge. Now, a lot of Mormons think that God is still learning in his capacities as a God who is progressing in his knowledge and power. But the way that Mormons speak of human history, at least earthly history, is that God knew what things would come to pass. And so Kweku wanted me to represent the narrow strain, as it were, of modern evangelicalism, namely Calvinism. But um, he wanted, well, in reality, he doesn't even represent the mainstream LDS position on this. He just represents a more apologetic. So, well, sorry, I cut you off. Well, I was going to ask you that. That was actually where I was. My question was was basically, do you think though that the Mormon view of a man becoming God, it, it, it seems like that the the that this God now would have to be the God of open theism. Because if man knows things discursively, like comes to no knowledge, that's how we know things then how could, how could you just inject this man with, um, you know, with definite foreknowledge or something? How would that even happen when he suddenly becomes a god? I don't know. I, I, I've been thinking about it since the debate. It, it seems like that the position he takes is the sort of logical outworking of Mormonism. I don't, do you agree or disagree on that? I do agree. I, um, I went to a few symposiums of the Society for Mormon Philosophy and Theology. <clears throat> And they had a uh, a non-Mormon speaker there, <clears throat> one symposium, named Richard Sherlock. And Richard Sherlock said this, quote, Mormons are better open theists than open theists. They still, the they here is non-Mormon open theists, they, cl- classic open theists, still want to say human beings are created by God. Now, Mormonism doesn't think that humans are created by God in the fundamental sense. They think that we're co-eternal with God, that we've always existed in our inner intelligence core subject self, they, think, they don't think that's created at all. But you're absolutely right. There's, there's two classic LDS views on this. One is that if you become exalted as a god, you will burst forth into infinite knowledge. You will become, uh, at an instant, you'll, you'll transition from finite knowledge to infinite knowledge. The other view was held by Brigham Young. Brigham Young taught that the only alternative to progression is diminishing. So he held that the gods, the exalted gods, always progress in all of their attributes. 
So God, uh, gods are progressing in their power, in their character, in their knowledge. And so they're totally learning. But even in that model, though, those who hold to that classically really have not held to the open theist position. They've still affirmed that at least God knows with respect to his own children, what future moral decisions will be made. Anyway, hope that helps a little bit. Just, yeah, no, I think that's, that's super interesting because I think that's, uh, I mean, something that I would, you know, want to kind of put, and I think you and I maybe have discussed this a little bit, but in some of the debates, uh, I, saw, I saw a debate that Kwaku did with a, a pastor on God's, um, I forgot what it was like. What, does God have a body or? Um... Jeremy Howard, is God merely an idea? Okay, yeah. yeah. And so, it, but it seemed like that to push him on, because, because I mean, to, to push him on the implications of, uh, on, on open theism, um, and the, I, it seems like the metaphysical necessity of God being in, basically, an op, you know, being open to the future because of him being an exalted man. I think that's an interesting, that'd be an interesting kind of line to kind of push to see, you know, with, with the LDS, because it seems like that, that he's, you know, I think he's being, it seems to me like he's being honest and saying that's, that we're, that, it, that is where it has to go. It's intellectually honest in its consequence, but it's still not representative of what his leaders have taught. Right. No, I agree with that. Um, all right. So let's, let's, I want to, let's double back real quick because I thought you're, uh, then, then I want to, then we can kind of finish up with him kind of pushing on the predestination stuff. Cause I thought your, your cross was very interesting and, um, so you actually, you bring up um, the David uh, and, and you bring up the, the David for a particular reason um, because you, the, the LDS believe that David is not, an, is not exalted, right? They, they believe that he didn't make it to the celestial kingdom because of murder. And I think you did a, a really good job of, of, of showing how that doesn't seem, what doesn't, doesn't seem that isn't uh, the biblical view. So maybe would you sort of expound on that uh, for a minute? Absolutely. So. Talking about grace with Mormons can be really tough again, because uh, every term can be equivocated on. Every term needs severe definition. It's really hard to have discussions because holding a definition consistently is tough in a long conversation. And anyway, there's a lot of definitional groundwork that has to be done. And so there's a lot of, and, and honestly, in the last couple of decades within Latter-day Saint evangelical dialogue, there's just been a lot of squishiness about where exactly Latter-day Saints land on the issue of grace. So uh, my str strategy is to give very concrete examples. So when I did my debate with Robert Vukic on a, a Mormon book called The Miracle of Forgiveness, I talked about David, uh, the apocryphal story of the woman caught in adultery. I call it apocryphal, I'm not sure what to call it. The thief on the cross and those who murdered Christ. I think it's Acts 3, Peter says, you killed the author of life. In all four of those examples, Mormon leaders have taught none of them were forgiven. And there's one more example with respect to exaltation anyway. And when I say forgiven, they're not forgiven. They're not fully forgiven. They're not maximally, they're not deeply, like most <sighs> consequently forgiven. They might, there, there might be like a kind of partial forgiveness, but they're not invited back. They're not necessarily completely forgiven at the moment of the stories, nor um, in the David's case is he welcomed into the celestial kingdom into God's presence. He's permanently banned from the highest level of heaven where God lives. And so there's one more, there's one more example I meant to bring up in the cross-examination if I had time. I was totally fooling myself on time. Is, uh, and this, this is breathtaking. Mormon leaders have taught that in the parable of the prodigal son, part of the point of the story is that the elder son retained his exaltation status, his, his worthiness. And the prodigal son, although in some sense forgiven, lost his exaltation. So whereas you, you and I might read that story as this beautiful, complete restoration of the prodigal son back into the family, father throws him a party, you know, all the full benefits of being a son. Um, Mormon leaders have taught that wag the finger, you better not be like the prodigal son because he lost his exaltation, though he was in some sense forgiven. And so anyway, with, with Kwaku, I don't mean to cut you off, but that is super interesting because, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you, uh, Keller wrote the book, The Prodigal God, basically about that, that whole um, parable. And it's so interesting because the, that parable is, you know, 
Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and it seems like the Mormons, the LDS, have have basically just gone exactly to where the parable was pointed, you know, to the to the Pharisees, and saying that they've, you know, that they're they're embodying that by by their by by that uh, analysis of that story. That that's just uh, I don't know. That, that's I, it's I never, a tragic. I've, yeah, that's a great observation. So with Quaku, I really wanted to use David as a concrete example, and with respect to the the evangelical slash Mormon debate or dialogue or discussion on over grace, David is a wonderful convergence of different issues. One is scripture straightforwardly teaches that his sin was put away. That when Nathan talks to David, he says, your sin has been put away. And in the Joseph Smith translation, Joseph Smith says, your sin has not been put away. And the, I, what I, in what I think is the starkest passage in the New Testament about justifying grace, Romans 4, verse 5, to the one who does not work but trust him who justifies the ungodly. This is David related, if you hold on for a second. Romans 4. Yeah, and, and the, the condition there is you have to stop working for it and you have to start trusting God who justifies the ungodly. Joseph Smith, in the Joseph Smith translation, changes it to say, to him who just, uh, trust him who justifieth not the ungodly. And the reason this is David connected is in the next verse, Paul says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And he quotes from a couple passages from Psalm 32, blessed is the, is the man whose sins are forgiven. Well, uh, in, in the Doctrine and Covenants. So to be clear to the listener, in the Joseph Smith translation, he's essentially inverting the whole meaning of Romans 5, 4, 5 through 8 straightforwardly and Mormon scholars that I've seen interaction with on this, they don't know what to do with this because, because Romans one through three make an entire case for us being ungodly. That's the point. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I wish I had brought this up in the debate DNC chapter. So DNC is doctrine and covenants as part of Mormon scripture. Uh, section 42, verse 18, it says, Thou shalt not kill, and he that kills shall not have forgiveness in this world, nor in the world to come. So uh, in, in, in Acts 3, when Peter preaches, uh, you killed the author of life, repent, you know, that your sins may be blotted out. Joseph Smith, who is on this sort of horse, this, he, 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 he has a point to make. He can't get rid of this idea that murderers can't be forgiven. But when he gives commentary on Acts 3, Joseph Smith says that their sins were blotted out, but they weren't forgiven. This is a weird distinction. He, Joseph Smith says that it's, it's worth noting that Peter did not tell them to be baptized for the remission of sins. And he argues that they could not have baptism for the remission of sins. So even today, Mormon missionaries are taught not to baptize ex-murderers. Well, didn't not they, to baptize. Didn't they... Um... Hasn't Hitler been um, baptized, you know, post yeah, posthumously? The, you can't read too much into that because of the way names, that's sort of the, the list of names is run through in a temple system like that. It's not that it necessarily fits with their theology. It, it just, people kind of get snuck in there that weren't meant to be in there. But Murder essentially is the unforgivable sin, is, at least as far as all, exaltation. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which they today define as sort of having a personal and uh, personal bodily visitation of Jesus Christ, and then you still reject him, something to that effect, or murder. So they treat murder like, it, it, like they're so strangely obsessed with making sure murder is not fully forgivable. The, the point here is not that I'm trying to do a gotcha on Mormons. The point here is that David is esteemed, or at least held up in scripture, as a role model for repentance and faith and the blessing of forgiveness. I mean, David is a man after God's own heart and he ends up being a scumbag because he uh, violates Bathsheba and he has Uriah and, a, and a, some other men murdered essentially or killed consequently. And uh, this is mind blowing that God would put away his sin, give him full forgiveness. And this is the Psalms. Uh, David says things, like, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He says that uh, in, in other ways over and over again. And so I remember the first evangelistic uh, interaction I ever had in Utah, 
on my mission trip was when I asked an older gentleman about Psalm 51, David's uh, forgiveness psalm, one of, one of two, I think, or one of two major. And I asked about David, and I said, did David get what he asked for? And David asks in Psalm 51, deliver me from blood guiltness, blood guiltiness. And the, the gentleman said that he didn't get what he asked for. So David uh, is crying out for the very presence of God. He's crying out not to have the Holy Ghost taken from him. He's crying out for complete forgiveness, to be cleansed, to be restored, to be in that of a teacher of God's ways. And he's esteemed as a role model of forgiveness and repentance and justification apart from works in Romans 4. And uh, Mormonism cuts that completely. So Mormon leaders, I, I was in the debate, I was quoting Mormon leaders to Kwaku who have said that David is paying for his sins right now in hell. Now, hell means like four different things in Mormonism. So it, 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 in particular, he's in spirit prison, this intermediate state, paying for his own sin. The blood of Jesus does not cover murder. And historically, in Mormonism, this way this has fleshed out is capital punishment was, was I know I believe in capital punishment, uh, Genesis 9, 6, but the, it was rationalized in Mormonism uh, through or from the premise that the blood of Jesus doesn't cover murder. And so Brigham Young extrapolated from that, that you have to have your own bloodshed to help pay for that. That's um, where they have still have um, um, fi death by firing squad, right? In, in Utah. And it's Historically, it's sort of the echo or, or kind of impulse behind some of the thinking behind that. But so with Kwaku, I was really trying to give David like a fair shake here. I was trying to help illustrate that David is a very clear example of where Mormonism doesn't think that Jesus's blood is enough. It doesn't think that empty handed faith is enough to receive the complete forgiveness and eternal life and full salvation benefits in David's case. And so some of the, like the funny business that happened in the, in the critical, by the way, I totally cut him off a few times in the cross exam on part one. And I, in my write-up, I, I apologize to him for that. There is, it's kind of tricky here because some people think that the entire format of cross-examination is just rude by nature <laughs> because it's adversarial. It's examining. It's, it's kind of, it's interesting when, when, when it comes to religion, people think that you shouldn't do any kind of aggressive cross-examination ever in any context. But when it comes to politics and congressional hearings and, you know, court of law, it's okay. But, you know, so I have to make these judgment calls. Is Kwaku hedging? Is he refusing to really answer the question? Has he satisfactorily already answered the question? We need to move on. We've got a lot of material to cover in like eight minutes. But what happened is I totally cut him off a few times prematurely. And that was bad manners on my part. That was rude. And so I apologize for that. It's a couple of regrets in a debate like that. But so I really wanted to show that David doesn't receive the grace that the New Testament gospel gives us. Um, I, I was hoping to bring up the prodigal son as well. Wait a minute. You're saying, you want, I'm sorry. You wanted to show that David in Mormonism doesn't receive the grace. Is that right? I'm sorry. That's what I meant. Yeah. I, I want, I want to be on team David here. I'm going to be where team David, is. I'm going to go where David is. That's the point I made in, in part three, kind of as a throwback. I'm going to be with David, with my wife, who won't be my wife at that point in heaven. And I'm going to be enjoying the presence of God by grace. And Mormonism can't give us that. Mormonism refuses to give King David uh, that kind of grace. And it refuses to really fully appreciate empty-handed faith as the alone instrument of, of receiving that kind of grace. You, you, yeah, I think you did a good job of making that point. And, you know, so in his, so his cross-examination was basically, you know, the first question, you know, did God predestine, I think it was the first question, the Holocaust, you know, and then, and then did, did God predestination, predestine slavery? Did he predestine, um, you know, he used the example of just, just hor any, any horrible thing that you could um, come up with. Um, now, I don't, my, I guess, you know, so his position, I guess, is going back to, again, the question was, <laughs> going back to what was the, the topic was, is salvation by faith alone? So I'm guessing he's trying to make the point that, I guess that, you know, since God decreed all this stuff and ultimately he's, you don't really have salvation by faith alone. It's because of God's decree and God decreed all this stuff. Again, you know, this is your whole point, which was, you know, I think what you said at the beginning was that this is where the whole thing kind of veered off into this just discussion of Calvinism. And we, you know, we lost sight of the actual, you know, what the topic was. In fact, one of the 
one of our friends, he, he chided me. He said, as the moderator, I should have gotten in and, and told Kwaku to get back on topic. But, but the whole point, you know, his whole thing was, did God, pre you know, and, and I think, you know, you, you said yes, right? And so maybe do you want to flesh that out a little bit? Because I know that I think even in our discussions back and forth, you, I think you felt like maybe you know, by saying it, you, you still didn't, you didn't do, you didn't, you weren't able to kind of flesh out what does that mean? And, you know, he, he made it act like, you know, made you, made it seem like you were saying that God is the author of evil, you know? So I don't know, maybe you want to, you know, flesh out sort of your responses to, so even though this is, you know, tangential to the debate, you know, his whole yeah. questions and all of that was basically, did, did God predestine any, everything? And your answer was yes. Yeah. When I say, that God predestines something, at least what I mean is that he has decided that it will inevitably come to pass, that it will certainly come to pass. And he has decided that it, that that shall come to pass. It's not uncertain to him. It's not plan B it's plan A, but I'm making distinctions there. Like the ultimate plan and then what he morally prescribes to us are two different things. So God says, you shall not murder. And yet he predestines the murder of Jesus Christ. I would even say that that's not a Calvinistic unique position necessarily. That's Molinists are pretty comfortable with that. Arminians, I think are in Roger Olson's book, Arminian theology, he has a chapter on predestination of sin. And he just argued, I think he essentially argues that all sin is predestined, uh, or at least some, at least, I'm sorry, I won't overstate some sins are at least predestined consequent to the fall. In his view, predestination is a judicial response to the fall, view of the fall having already happened. All of what follows is sort of a concept. Anyway, all that to say, um, when I say predestined- There's problems with that because then, you, then why did the fall, then God didn't know the fall was going to happen. So you still got, you know, you still got huge issues there, I think. The philosophy gets super interesting. And we've got friends that are doing PhD, PhD whole dissertations on this. So how do I summarize this? So if somebody said, do you believe this terrible event XYZ was predestined? I would just say yes, because all events, I think, were predestined in the sense that it's part of the ultimate plan of God. But that doesn't mean the thing itself, the event itself, was ethical. All the things that Quaku mentioned that were terrible, the Holocaust, that's not ethical. It's terrible. It's, it's worth that's why hell exists is because God's going to punish evildoers who are not covered by the blood of Jesus. The rhetorical effect of this though, is that I'm being callous to the, the way this happened in the cross exam is that I'm being callous to the, the Holocaust. I, you know, I somehow morally approve it or something like that. And the rhetorical effect is that God has a kind of puppeteering causal direct relationship on things. And it's interesting after this debate happened, I thought that is not, it wasn't fair to me because I wasn't given an opportunity to really flesh out my terms, my distinctions, my ideas, my arguments on this. And I thought, oh my goodness, a year ago in April of 2019, Quaku and I did a year, uh, an hour and a half dialogue on the street where we actually covered, is God the author of evil? That kind of topic for quite some time as a major part of the dialogue. And I was able to flesh that out. So I'm going to try to publish that this week sometime. But in that dialogue, I you know, made the point that when God created everything, Evil wasn't a part of that. It was a good, pristine, pure, sinless uh, creation. And uh, evil is, is not a separate substance that God created. It, evil is nothing more than the perversion of good. It's like taking a straight line that God created and then bending it. And how he's able to plan things out and have evil be a part of the, the, of the course of human history how he's able to create everything in an, in an original, pristine, sinless condition, how that all philosophically works together. I just shrug my shoulders at this point. And I said, I don't know. I, but my, my posture as a Christian is I'm trying to submit to the particulars of scripture and um, yeah, affirm that as much as I can. And, and the, the difficulty is that we have to deal with very active verbal language in the New Testament where God sends the Assyrians to punish Israel and then punishes Assyria. He predestines the cross and all of its participants, Acts 4, 27, 28. He, he raises up evil. Nathan says that on God's behalf to David. He was going to raise up evil within David's house. And we have clues in scripture how God might accomplish some of this while being holy, while not being a sinner, while not being unethical, while not being the tempter. 
a really great example of this is in Romans 7. It's on the other chapters as well. Romans makes this point in like chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 7. One of the ways that God increased sin in Israel was by simply giving them the law. If you want, if you want to take a carnal fallen creature and get them to sin more, you just need to tell them not to sin more. <laughs> like tell and your then, kids, don't look at the roof. And then all of a sudden they're like, I really want to look at the roof right now. Yeah. Yeah. So the holy law was able to, that occasioned more sin. And so can God be the ultimate orchestrator using mechanisms like that, that are pure and holy without himself tempting people to sin without himself being a part of a causal chain of the kind or of the sort that makes him morally culpable for sin? The biblical answer is yes. The philosophical position that I think is most biblically faithful is Calvinism. But man, I sure respect my Molinist brothers who take that's my favorite form of non-Calvinism, by the way. Like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm their cheerleader in some respects, because they, they have such a robust view of God's sovereignty. I really respect it. Or, the, even like, the, or even Thomism. Or, I mean, but any view that basically holds to a high view of God's sovereignty. But the question is, like you said, philosophically, how is God able to, you know, I think you brought up in the debate, uh, Genesis 50, you know, what, what, uh, when Joseph is telling the brothers, you know, what, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And yet they, f they freely chose to do those things. So how is he able mm -hmm. to do those things? We don't, you know, there's different philosophical yeah. systems to try to get at that. But I think the thing that Kwaku, he thinks what you're saying is that I think what you said earlier is right. He thinks that you think God is, you know, like a Mary has us on a Marion is a marionette and he was just a puppeteer and he is actually, you know, doing the sin through us. And that's, you know, but no, yeah. you know, there's, there's no, uh, you know, well-thinking Christian, you know, whether Calvinist or Thomist or, or Molinist who, who would ever hold to that position. Right. Because I mean, you know, it just, that's just not what the scripture and, and we're, you know, I think being faithful to the text, what you're doing is saying, look, what we see is we see, people freely choosing things. And we see that God is, um, you know, predestined these things and sovereign. So how do you make sense of that? You know, and trying the best we can to, to make sense of that, but it's not the, the puppeteer. Yeah. yeah. One regrettable part of the debate was at Quake, who said something like, I've only got seconds left. So let me ask this last question. Is God the author of sin? And I had seconds left. So I'm trying to spit out these words as fast as I can. I'm like, uh, God is not the author of sin. I think I'm, if I remember correctly. And I mumbled, he is the morally culpable origin. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you about that. Yeah, because it sounded, yeah, because I wanted you to like, expound on that because I wanted to make, because oh. it did, I think there was a way in which you could, people could hear it and say, basically, he's the one that's the more, he's morally culpable. You know, he's the one that's doing it, I think is how people could have inferred that. So I wanted you to, yeah, I was actually going to have you respond yeah, he, to that. He responded by saying, God's the author of, or God's the origin of sin or God's the or author of sin. And so if you were listening sympathetically and sort of patiently, with me. The next thing I said was, well, God's the primary cause of all things uh, without being morally culpable for secondary causes. And so you can say, oh, that's probably what he meant. That was my sort of explanatory follow-up. Now, I know it was gone in my head when those words came out. What I was trying to say is, God's not the author of sin in the sense of being the morally culpable origin. He is the primary cause of all things without being morally culpable for secondary causes. Here's the problem with this. One is I mumbled the connecting phrase. Two is, and I don't think people in the audience really understand the language I'm using. I, I mean, this was so unfair to me. I, I, I lodge a formal complaint because I was not given the opportunity to set up my definitions or explain or give an argument for that. Because this, if we had had a debate where that was like an overt topic, I could have built up a case and explained my position. But what Quaker got out of this was some sort of rhetorical gotcha stuff. And this was so unfair to me because I, I want to represent my position in a way that's commensurate with what I'm actually thinking. And this is just how I'm going to spit this out as fast as I can ad hoc. Anyway. The remember the topic, yeah. you know, for listen, the topic was, is salvation by faith alone? And now we're, you know, we're on, is God the primary or, you know, secondary cause of <laughs> evil, right? And so, you know, we're, we're way, we're, we've long since left the uh, station and what we should have been talking about. Yeah, partly that's my fault because it was partly my responsibility not to go down rabbit trails, not to um, take the bait, not to... I, it was partly my responsibility to help keep I, uh, the debate within the parameters as it was advertised. And now I'm trying not to be too hard to myself because this went down pretty quickly. And I was 
out of a good impulse, try not to hedge on things or show myself to be embarrassed about what scripture teaches. But yeah, so part of the problem here is that primary cause and secondary causation, that's philosophical language. The, the, the word cause informally, casually and colloquially in our world, that typically is construed in terms of more direct, coercive, you know, kind of atoms bumping, it, bumping against, against other atoms kind of causation, where you have a kind of mechanical causal chain. I don't think people realize what I was trying to say. Boy, I, I uh, wish I could have had more time to kind of flesh that out. Fortunately, in this dialogue that I found on video with Kwaku from a year ago, we did flesh it out a bit more, where I got to actually explain my position more. But I, that was a totally regrettable moment in the debate. In fact, uh, Kwaku ended up putting that clip into a new video where he paints me with a Hitler mustache and intersperses the video with... So I, I gesticulate a lot. I, I'm pretty emphatic, and I put my arms all over the place. And so he got me with my hand up at one point, calling attention to a point, and then he interspersed it with a Hitler clip and a Hitler, you know, Nazi music, and trying to say that, you know, trying to imply that I think I morally approve of the Holocaust or... Yeah, yeah. Let, there were... Uh, yeah, so that's just... yeah. I'm Sorry, not, I dropped a bomb there. But no, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, there's just nothing. I mean, that's just, you know, I mean, there's nothing. There's no, there's no way. That's just, it was just complete. That's just crazy and unethical and you know i would hope that kwaku would uh you know i mean he's he's a young guy and and look i mean i i mean you know certainly on our position but i believe it's true as he's an, an unregenerate young man with a lot of you know is smart funny and um you know has a pretty good totally. audience so he's going to do things like that because it's going to it's going to get the reaction that he wants to get i would hope that even as we interact as so we think of each other as false teachers kwaku categorically would think of me as a false teacher. I would think of him as a false teacher. I would hope that even as we go after each other pretty aggressively, that we would do so with some uh, courtesy and common decency. And when if we make mistakes, apologize for them. And I, I've actually had some pretty positive interactions with Kwaku in the past over and over and over again. If Kwaku is listening to this, can we try to get him a better, can we try to reconcile over some of this stuff like this, like these videos? It seems like bad behavior. I would love to get to a better place where we can use... Maybe we can interact more professionally, if I could use that term. As, right, as, uh, so let me uh, let me yeah. ask you uh, let me ask you two questions. I know we're we're running long, but this is this is a good discussion because I think this is this came up, and I would I want you to just give you a chance to respond to it because I think he's going to make a he makes a big deal out of um, so two well three things. <laughs> so I know that uh, three things that uh, I you know, want to give you a chance to respond to. Um, you, you know, he kind of, he's walked through per, this person, this person, this person, and I, you and I just, uh, I've, I saw some discussion that you had with some other person on this topic. He asked you, is Mother Teresa in hell? And you said, uh, probably so. Agree, still agree with that? Would you maybe want to flesh that out a little bit more or? Let me uh, preface this with another thing and then I'll answer it directly. If somebody said, do you believe Hitler's in hell? It's interesting in the evangelical world, there's a lot of people who would say, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people would say, um, well, maybe he made a deathbed confession, you know, seconds before he, he shot himself. Maybe, maybe we don't know. Maybe Jesus appeared to him in a vision or a dream, you know, an hour before his death, and he received the gospel. You know, who knows? And I think there's a really healthy, beautiful evangelical impulse to say, I'm not the final judge. I'm not omniscient. Um, I don't make the final determination. I don't know everything. But when it comes to questions like that, there's a kind of, an, there's often just an implicit provisional qualifier, like with Hitler, you know, by the way, Mother Teresa and Hitler are not equivalent here. But the idea is though, I don't have any reason to believe that Hitler received the evangelical gospel of, of empty handed faith receiving Christ's atonement. And I have every reason to believe that he was a murderous, hateful, satanic person. Now, when it comes to Mother Teresa, I don't know much about her, but I, what I do know about her is that she was a pretty committed practicing Roman Catholic. I think she's also famous for a prayer to Mary. She's known for her humanitarian impulses. She's known for her love for the poor and the sick. And those are beautiful things. But I'm an evangelical Christian. I don't think good works like that quickly give evidence of salvation. I think there's a common grace given to humanity where very lost people who don't know God do very uh, beautiful things like that that aren't in relationship with God. My operating assumption as a classical Protestant who believes the Protestant Reformation was needed is that if somebody dies committed and believing 
the Roman Catholic doctrine in a robust, committed way. <clears throat> if somebody came to my church, like Mother Teresa, who's got a great reputation for her love for the poor and the sick, but she doesn't believe in salvation by grace through faith, with empty-handed faith, if she really believes what the Catholic Church teaches, that there's a treasury of merits, that she has to merit uh, her justification in part, then I would say uh, to her, if she, was in my, if she attended my church as a guest, I would share the gospel with her and I would warn her as gently as I could. If you don't receive the gospel by faith alone, you're gonna go to hell and be punished for your sins. And none, none of the humanitarian work you've done or none of the good reputation you have will get you credentials, will get you a backstage pass into the kingdom of God. I don't believe good people go to heaven. Uh, there are no good people. Right. And everyone's good, got good a people would side. go to heaven, right, if there were. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone's got a dark side. And I would say the same, same of uh, Mother Teresa and Anne Frank. So when I say th the direct answer, do you think Mother Teresa's in hell? And I say probably, that's a very provisional answer. I'm just assuming she has not received the gospel of salvation by grace through faith alone. I know some people are pretty hopeful that there's Catholics out there that are sort of evangelical in spirit, like a, a G.K. Chesterton. I've got Protestant friends that are pretty hopeful about guys like that. I'm just trying to be consistent with the way Kwaku framed the question. Because it was, it was immediately after the question, uh, you know, if a guy, if there's a guy who does all these terrible things, he listed all, he just listed all a bunch of terrible things, but then trust Jesus on his deathbed, you know, is he going to be with God in the new heavens and new earth, you know, an heir to heaven? And you said unequivocally, yes. I shouted yes. Amen. Hallelujah. I love that. Yeah. And so I think that's just, you're, I think the question is, you know, in this, this, I mean, at least that's hitting somewhat on the topic, you know, so we can give them credit. Like at least that is actually is the question, you know, is it, is it salvation by grace through faith alone? And so, you know, a person who's done terrible things, like we can go back to David, right. But has faith. Yes. And a person who's done quote unquote good things, even though we see in what, you know, that there is no one that does good. No, not one. Um, that's not enough. That's just, you know, we, and we believe that's what scripture says, you know, unequivocally. Yeah. If I had to give, if I had to flesh it out, if Mother Teresa has not received the gospel by grace through faith as a free gift, she will be punished for her sins. And the, and the New Testament teaches that she has deep, dark, sinful issues within her that are real and that are present, regardless if she has a beautiful reputation for things that we can commend her for in her work with the sick and the poor and so forth. And regardless if she published great literature, it, 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 that's the big issue. In the end, I don't know because I'm not God and I, I don't know her heart and I, I have to make sort of these provisional assessments based on the evidence. In normal life, I don't want to be quick to make those judgments. But what I was trying to do with Kwaku is own unembarrassed the consequences of Protestant theology. Namely, if you don't receive justification by faith alone, then you will not be justified. Right. So. All right. And so then, and then that was the same, and there was some discussion about, you know, Anne Frank and, you know, he makes a big, you know, the corrupt Anne Frank, you know, he talks about that, but it's the same, the same idea, right? Is that, you know, cause you said that, that she was worthy of condemnation. And I think he mm -hmm. kind of, you know, bristled at that, but you're basically just making that point that all of us are worthy of condemnation. You know, that there is no one that does good. No, not one, right. No one seeks after God. And so all of us deserve complete separation from him. Um, you know. I'm actually kind of surprised that Kwaku was, was taken back by that part because it's pretty standard Mormon theology, <clears throat> at least with respect to the Book of Mormon, that as a consequence of the fall, humans are carnal and sensual by nature. We have you know, sin, nature, or dispositional issues. I've talked to plenty of Latter-day Saints who would at least agree in principle that at least all of functioning uh, adults, or at least people uh, in Mormonism, they have the age of accountability at age eight. Anne Frank has well past age eight at the time of her death. She, even by Latter-day Saint theology, was in need of a baptism for the remission of her sins. I wasn't trying to be harsh toward Anne, Hank, Fra sorry, Anne Frank at all. I was trying to be theologically clear about the uh, state of carnal man, universal, and, and our universal need of salvation. Anne Frank is not exempt from the need for salvation from our depravity. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I, it would it'd been interesting to kind of, what do you think Anne Frank um, needed a savior? You know, I mean, to, to Kwaku, because I mean, he would, he thinks she's in the same spot 
uh, as you do, uh, or he would, right? I mean, at least, uh, at least for the, for general salvation. All right. So all right, one last question. I know that we're, we're running long. You're probably, you know, you need to get back to your family, but I, th- I wanted you to, I wanted to give you a chance to maybe uh, sort of flesh this out a little bit, but there was a question that Quaku asked you about, did God predestine all the Mormons here to be Mormons? And then, and you, you, you said yes. And then, and then you said, I think that all of you know, I, I think all the Mormons here at some point are going to crash and burn. And, you know, and, and so what do you, you know, maybe what did you mean by that? And kind of, this is another regrettable moment the way it came out. He asked me if I thought all the evangelicals in the room were predestined to be evangelicals. So I just said, yes. So he asked, are the Mormons here, were they predestined to be Mormon? And I was pretty, going at it pretty energetically, exuberantly, aggressively with Kwaku. And what I did is I turned to the crowd and I said, oh, I don't know about that. In 10 years, I think a lot of you are going to be burnt by Mormonism, burnt out by Mormonism. You're going to be, you're going to have left by that point. Not, not all of you. I didn't say all of you, but I said, you know, many of you, I think, are going to be burnt over by Mormonism. Burnt out was the idea of it. And I'm going to be trying to share the, try to share the gospel with you at that point. This just did not help. Uh, in two ways. One is, I, that was a perfect moment to speak with empathy because the people that I was trying to speak to at that point, they're not my enemy. Oh my goodness. So if I had time to reflect on this a little bit, I've got friends in Utah, a lot of friends who I knew as Mormon 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago, and they're not Mormon anymore. And I live in Salt Lake County. I live in, I, I, I work in the tech industry. I don't know what it's like necessarily for those in the bubble of Orem or Provo anymore, where BYU is, but where I live, there's like two or three LDS families on my entire street of like 24 houses. My goodness, the, the number of people that have left Mormonism is staggering. And the people that are still in it who don't believe is staggering. Or the people that are still in it that have one foot in, one foot out. Or the people that are in it and are kind of believe, but they're more so just secular progressive. And they're sort of, they're energized really by modern politics. They're not really energized by religion or their fundamental truth claims of the religion. So the background of what's going on here is probably hard to p- pick up there. But what I'm trying to say is there's a ton of people that are Mormon today that won't be Mormon in 10 years. And that's, that, that informs our evangelism because it means that a lot of what we do can circumvent Mormonism and just talk about basic gospel stuff. And a lot of what we do should be compassionate toward people that they're going through a very traumatic transition. Now, there's also an emotion I have here of anger. Uh, And I do believe it's righteous anger. Mormonism burns people out. It makes them super cynical about religion. They're primed by their own leaders to have a severe and cynical distrust of the Bible or of the evidential available nature of sort of the evidences that would encourage us to have real faith or the reliability of the New Testament, or the believability of God. Mormons are primed to be cynical about every major tenet of Christianity, such that if they become disillusioned with their own leadership or Joseph Smith, they crash and they burn. And what I mean by that, I wasn't trying to be nasty, but what what I mean by that is they go through hell. They go through hell. They go through weeks or months or years of realizing they've been lied to of trying to just figure out what just happened to them. They just, you know, I know families that have spent, that have sent all their kids on missions, like eight kids on missions. And then they read, you know, they stumble on something. A lot of what time, a lot of times what happens is that somebody has a teaching assignment for Sunday morning. And so they, they search on Google for some topic or text. I, I know a family, for example, that, stumbled across Bill McKeever's video on what went down on Joseph Smith's death and how he shot people with his gun when he was dying and just how the real events went down. And they were so shocked by the actual history of Joseph Smith's death that they started going down a rabbit hole of what else have I not been taught or what else have I been falsely taught? And what happens is they go through a trauma of, and and a disillusionment. And the big question is, and the big miracle is, whether they come to really hang on to Jesus as resurrected, as in God as real, um, the Bible as trustworthy. So I have a mixture of emotions here. I've got anger toward Mormonism for um, 
priming people for unbelief and for hurting people, ruinously lying to people. I've got empathy and compassion for people. And that, that, that did not come out in that moment in the debate. So um, your, your anger was, or your, your tone was more a, a, against Mormonism and, and not against Mormons. Oh yeah. That's a lot easier to, to show in private conversation one-on-one. -on -one. That's where the gentleness really shines in more of an aggressive debate with a false teacher where you're doing rapid fire cross-examination and fiery preaching in the presentations. Probably harder for the average Mormon sensibilities to pick up on it, but I'm hoping that the word of God shined and it was made clear enough. God has a way of using the word of God to cut through any fog. You know, I can sleep well because of Genesis 50, 20. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, and I think, and I've seen you, um, you know, sort of to your credit, I mean, I've seen you, uh, you know, in person, in your interactions with people, just, just a very loving way, you know, again, just wanting people to, to hear, you know, to know the gospel and, and looking at people as, you know, as, as really as POWs, you know, and slaves to a false worldview and, um, and certainly to Satan and not, um, not, not angry, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but at the same time, angry at Mormonism. And I think the, maybe even the higher ups that are perpetuating lies. I know that, that's a hard, that's a hard thing. I think for it, that's one thing I was talking to some of the people that were critiquing the debate it, um, afterwards. And I think that was, that's a hard thing for people. You know, again, I've been here for, you know, what, six months. So obviously an expert on Utah, but I think it's a hard thing for people who aren't from here to understand all of that that's wrapped up in that debate. So it's easy for someone to want that to be a little bit more academic and, um, I won't say cold, mm. but you know, then for someone, I mean, cause I, I actually was talking to someone afterwards, a Christian, and she was just excited that there was, that there was, you know, for the, what she felt like one time in her life, you know, growing up here and being surrounded by this her whole life, that there was someone who was challenging uh, Mormonism and standing up for, for God, you know? And so mm. that's just something that is hard to, you just, you know, and again, I don't, you know, I don't understand it well, but only being here for a little bit of time, but that, it, that I wouldn't have understood at all, you know, uh, a year ago that, do I think that, 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 you know, in some sense, not to say, you know, yeah, calls for certain, you know, that allows for that emotion to come out that it's, this is not just an academic debate. This is reality. You know, these are people's souls. Anyway, so that was, that was great, man. I, uh, I appreciate the discussion and this was, I think this is a, hopefully people will watch um, that part of the debate. If you're watching this and you go online and, and I'll put links in the description to the debate so you can watch that part and then you can hear the breakdown. And, um, and then what we'll do hopefully uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks is uh, also review uh, section two, our families forever. I, I can't remember if we flip flop that or, um, but we'll do, do, do to see part two. Yeah. yeah families part uh, three. Okay, was there a great apostasy part two? And then, you know, our families forever. And so, we'll, yeah, we'll review those. And um, so, anyway, so thanks for, thanks for doing this. I know that uh, you've got a family to uh, attend to, but this was great. I really appreciate uh, just kind of walking through this and walking through the debate. And, you know, I was, I was encouraged by the debate. So I'm just really glad that um, you're, you know, just your willingness to, you know, to, to, to move out here and all, you know, your story. And so I hope people will watch your, your YouTube videos and, and check out all your stuff. Cause I just think it's, it's been super helpful for me and you've been a big encouragement to me uh, being out here. So, um, so Thank yeah, you, so thanks for, thanks for doing this. And, uh, yeah, we will, uh, we'll look to, uh, to do more of these over the next couple of weeks.